When I was studying the physics of electromagnetism, I never really understood what to think of the electric and magnetic fields. I was hearing from the professors about the lines of force that permeate the space coming from the magnet or a charged particle. But I was always wondering, like, are these a real physical lines coming out of these things? That was kind of unacceptable for me to believe. But a picture like this seems quite convincing since you can see clearly some line formation in iron particles. Or is it just a mathematical tool to understand these mysterious forces of electricity better? Okay, let's zoom out a little. To answer this question more profoundly, we first need to ask what the existence of something actually means. And sadly it's a philosophical question, but if we agree on certain definition, then we can answer this question precisely. If I take for example this object, and I claim that it exists, it means that I can interact with it. But not only me, but everybody in its proximity. If there was another person next to me who wouldn't be able to interact with this object, then I could question its existence, right? Because who is right? But the truth is that anybody who would come here would find out that he can interact with this object. And therefore I can claim that it exists. Or maybe better wording would be that anybody who would come here could in some sense measure the presence of this object. So what about the electric and magnetic fields? If there were electric and magnetic fields in this room, could anybody measure their presence? If yes, then I would argue they must exist. So this comes down to another question. What is electric and magnetic fields? But more importantly, how do we measure their presence? Imagine you are out in space and you want to know if there is an electric field in this area. The only way to find out is to take a charged particle with a certain mass, place it somewhere and measure the force acting on this particle. By this simple formula we can then calculate what the electric field at this point really is. And in principle there is no any other way. Every time we want to measure the presence of electric field, it must be done through measuring the forces acting on a charged particles. Now, what about magnetic field? And again, we are going to need a charged particle. If we place a charged particle at certain point in space, give it certain velocity in certain direction, and measure a force acting on the particle perpendicular to the velocity this way, then by this formula I can figure out what the magnetic field in this area is. If you want something more simple, you can use the Fleming left hand rule to figure out the direction. And now we arrive at the crux of the problem. The force coming from the electromagnetic field can be written in this unified way, where this part comes from the electric field and the second one comes from the magnetic field. But the force, electric field and magnetic field are vector quantities and therefore have three components in three-dimensional space. So you can split this vector equation into three equations for each force component. And the problem is that we can only measure force. Therefore, these are the numbers we know. But we want to figure out what are the components of the electric and magnetic fields. These are the unknowns. But as you can see, you have six unknowns, but only three equations. And as you might remember from your high school, this system is called underdetermined. This means that there are infinitely many possible combinations of electric and magnetic fields that could produce the same force. And therefore, by a single measurement of a force acting on a charged particle, we are not able to uniquely determine what this combination of electric and magnetic field is. The question is, can we somehow determine all six components of electric and magnetic field uniquely? Well, the good thing is that magnetic part of the force depends on the velocity of the charged particle. But if a particle is experiencing the force, then the velocity is gonna change with time. But 
if the velocity is gonna change with time, then the force itself must change with time. So instead of just one measurement, we can do two measurements at two different times. And now we will get six equations for six unknowns. And now each component of E and B field is defined uniquely. The problem is that this only works if we know that these electric and magnetic fields are not changing with time. Because if they were, then this would not be the same. And we'll be in a situation of six equations, but 12 unknowns, which is again underdetermined. But yeah, we can give up about the magnetic field and set the velocity of the particle to zero. Then we'll completely lose the information about the magnetic field, as this part of the equation will be zero, and we can measure the force. And now we can at least determine what the electric field at a given time is. Because the only source of force now can be the electric field, since the particle is not moving. And yeah, this would give you a certain result, and you would be happy that you can at least measure the electric field properly. But the particle is not moving only for you. Your friend could see it like this, and he could not ignore this part of the equations. The system of equations would again become underdetermined, and there will be infinite possibilities for how to choose the components of the electric and magnetic fields to make up the observed force, even such that the electric field is straight zero. Of course, if you knew that these electric and magnetic fields are static, then you could do another measurement at a later time, and this would indeed confirm the existence of electric field. But you can never be sure that these fields are static, right? So what to think of these fields now? Maybe they are just three-dimensional cuts of a four-dimensional entity. Just think about it for a moment. Getting a single measurement at a one particular time point was not enough to establish the electromagnetic field content uniquely. You needed this shift in time dimension to get a full picture of this four-dimensional entity. To give you some example, think of this ball in three dimensions. How big is it? Well, from just this picture it's impossible to tell because you don't know the distance to it. If it's like one meter away, then it's pretty small. But if it's like one light year away, then it would be pretty big. But if you could get another measurement from one meter closer to it, you would get a system of equations that is determined and you can solve it and find the solution. So as you can see, we needed some insight from the third dimension to establish the size of the ball properly. We live in a four dimensional world, right? But we are not treating all the four dimensions the same. We have three spatial dimensions and one dimension of time. But time passes the same for all of us. It doesn't give you any freedom of movement. I cannot decide to go forward or backwards in time. But I can at least to some degree move freely through space. The reason is that these four dimensions are not completely independent. They are connected by the fact that we all have to travel with the speed of light in this four-dimensional world. But most of this speed is through time dimension. Since here on Earth, we are all moving very slowly relative to each other. So it seems like time passes the same speed for everybody. So over the years, we have developed this intuition for three-dimensional world. And therefore, any entity that manifests somehow in this three-dimensional world we consider as the most real, even though the quantity itself can be more dimensional. So four-dimensional quantity has four components. So obviously in three dimensions, one vector isn't enough to capture everything about this quantity. To capture all, we need at least one another number. But that will be enough only if the other three quantities were completely independent. Okay, so another example to set this straight. In reality, you can represent any object by a certain collection of numbers. And the more complex the object is, the more numbers you need. For example, a ball can be represented by a single number. 
which is the radius. But it can also be a maximal circumference, surface, or volume. Whatever gives you enough information to have a complete description of the ball. If you have a cylinder, then you can take, for example, a circumference at a certain point and the length. So you need at least two numbers. But if you were stupid, you would choose a circumference and a radius at a certain point. You would still have two numbers, but you wouldn't have the complete information about the cylinder. Because there is a relation between these two numbers, so they are dependent on each other. So you can choose either circumference or radius together with length. And you have a complete description of the cylinder, but not circumference with radius. But you can take all three if you want, and that is completely okay. These are just different representations of the same object. Okay, back to the electric and magnetic fields. We have six numbers, or in general, six functions of space-time to represent the electromagnetic field content in all of space-time. But we are not going to explicitly write down this space-time dependence, but it's something you should be aware of. But these are not completely independent. They are coupled by the Maxwell's equations. And therefore you can find a different representation that requires just four functions and find the relations between these functions and the original electromagnetic fields. We call it the scalar and vector potentials. Again, be aware that each of these components can have a different value at different space-time points. So maybe it's not the electromagnetic field that we should consider to be real, but it's this electromagnetic four potential. But in most cases you will read that you cannot directly measure this four potential. What you measure are the electric and magnetic fields. But then there is this aharonov bohm effect, which tells us that it is the electromagnetic four potential that influences the quantum wave function, and not the electric and magnetic fields. There is also the Faraday paradox, in which you can't experimentally tell if you have a rotating magnet, whether the field lines rotate with the magnet or are stationary. Both of these views predict the same observed phenomena. But saying that it's the electromagnetic four potential that is real is still not quite right, because if you dig really deep into this rabbit hole, you would eventually find out that even these four components are not completely independent. There is the so-called gauge freedom, which means that we have infinitely many possibilities how to choose these two functions to recover the exactly the same electromagnetic field content. Namely, you can add a gradient of arbitrary function to the vector potential and time derivative of the function to the scalar potential. The proof is simple and is left to the viewer as an exercise. So, how can these quantities be considered real if we have the freedom to add a derivative of another whole function to them. If you really dig down this rabbit hole, you would eventually find out that there are only two physical degrees of freedom in all electromagnetism. Because in a vacuum, without any sources, the only electromagnetic field content present can be in a form of electromagnetic waves. And these two degrees of freedom represent the polarization of that wave. And as we know, light can have only a plane polarization that is perpendicular to the direction of motion. And that is why we need only two numbers to describe it. In principle, in the presence of sources, you could also have a longitudinal polarization component as well. But this component is completely given by the charge distribution in space via Maxwell's equations. So it doesn't give you a real physical degree of freedom, if that makes any sense. Maybe I will elaborate on it in another videos. But in a nutshell, the electromagnetic waves are the only real thing about electromagnetism, which are the photons or light. Everything you see is an electromagnetic wave and nothing else. It's something that you have the best possible intuition for. 
So how to properly understand all of this? Because I can imagine that you are probably even more confused than you were before. So the way I understand it is the following. The electromagnetic waves or photons are concrete manifestations of this phenomena called electromagnetism. They can travel freely through space for as long as possible and as far as possible. They contain the energy and momentum that can be transferred to another bodies. And if there is an electromagnetic wave or photon somewhere in a universe, then it's there for everyone independently of the observer and his state of motion. And everybody can interact with it. They are responsible for the only two degrees of freedom electromagnetism has. So they can live independently of the existence of any sources. So once it's created, you can destroy the source and it will continue to live forever. And lastly, we as a humans have incredibly good detector of these waves right here, which is more like a bonus and not necessary condition for existence of something. And therefore we can declare these manifestations of the phenomena of electromagnetism as real. But if we ask whether there are a physical lines coming from the magnet or a charge, then clearly not, since we can't even decide whether magnetic field lines are rotating with the magnet or not. So electromagnetic fields or electromagnetic four potential, those are just different representations of the phenomena that can create these real photons. And different representations are useful for different things. But when you are encounter modern physics, you will most likely encounter this four potential, as in any relativistic theory, because this four potential transforms nicely under Lorentz transformations. And you don't have to deal with this mess when using electric and magnetic field. And as I already told you, it has a measurable impact on the quantum wave function even though the electric and magnetic fields are zero. So in some sense, you could consider it to be more fundamental. But that might be a good subject for another video, maybe. I know that I left many rocks uncovered in this video, because there is just so much information squeezed in very little time. But maybe that's a reason why you should subscribe, because in another videos, these rocks will definitely be uncovered. So consider. And see you next time. Bye.